Welcome, investigator. Evil is on the rise. Crime is escalating. Our mission is to eliminate the crime by exposing evil, examine why it manifests, and highlight the brave souls that confront it every day. Join us as we work together to bring justice to every victim. Welcome to All Things Crime. Here's your host, Jared Bradley. Hey, everybody. It's Jared. Welcome to another episode of All Things Crime. Man, we got a treat for you this morning. We got two guests. We got Tom Myers, who's been a, with us a number of times. We also got Joe Kennedy. And if, you're, if you've been a fan of the, of the show for, I'm trying to think of the last time you were on, Joe. It had to have been at least two years ago. Uh, but Joe Kennedy, he is formerly with NCIS. He's a cold case and a homicide detective extraordinaire. Actually started the, the cold case homicide unit in the NCIS. So Joe and uh, Tom, welcome back to the show. All right. Good to be here, Jared. Thanks for having us back. Yeah, Joe. So, you know, you being the guest of honor here, you know, Tom's just one of those ranger guys I drag along everywhere. So, Joe, why don't you why don't you remind everybody, you know, kind of your background, how you got started, and maybe even introduce your book and, and how that came about. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Jared. I'll, I'll just try to go through this kind of quickly. I, uh, you know, spent the majority of my career with NCIS in the mid nineties. We had some cold cases that we started taking a look at, had a little bit of success. And from that, uh, the director kind of tapped me to, to be the team leader for our cold case homicide unit. So we formally, you know, the first case we saw as an agency was in, we basically went down to the Virgin Islands from January 95 till March and were able to get the case over the hump. It wasn't an extremely old case. It was only about a two-year-old case. But from there, I was tasked to, hey, let's set up a squad and then how do we do this? So I immediately went out to about 15 different departments throughout the United States, came back to my state of North Carolina, our State Bureau of Investigation had previously had a cold case unit. Went to Florida where I hooked up with Dave Rivers. Uh, and most people know Dave as having been one of the early pioneers of cold case squads. And then into Boston with Tim Murray, Steve, Steve Murphy, you know, and all, all around the country to, of who was doing it. And what I realized was nobody really had a, a methodology and protocols. A lot of people doing cold cases, but, you know, they didn't, didn't have it written down anywhere. So I just took from those 15 different departments and folks, right, other detectives of what worked for them came back, developed a methodology and protocol for us. And then uh, we created a squad and, and that squad, I think has been fairly successful. And then from there kind of went around the world, helping people set up cold case squads, whether it was in Asia, Europe, uh, Central South Latin America. And, uh, and then I retired 2014, 2016, we started the Carolinas cold case coalition here in North Carolina. A lot of retired local state and federal officers, we just help police departments. It started out just in North South Carolina, but it's expanded now throughout the country. Uh, we're going to look at some cases overseas. And we don't try to tell folks how to do it, right? We just say, hey, we're looking at the case. These are maybe some suggestions we would make. And so that's kind of my, my foray into cold case. When you ask about the book, you know, I had for a number of years wrote down things of, you know, how do you work a cold case? What works? What doesn't work? How do we save time, right? How do we save energy? Because as you know, manpower and resources are so hard to come by in law enforcement that many departments wouldn't even allow people to work cold cases, right? And, and that's still true today, but, you know, based on the limited resources. So I had, you know, kept some good notes and, and put together what I would say was, you know, a working journal. So I was involved in a, a documentary series, a case you worked on, the case I think the MVAC was used on, which was, was Chris Tapp out of, Idaho Falls. And we worked at with Joe Berlanger out of New York, a couple of wrongful convictions where the, the wrong suspect was in jail. So let's go figure out who the right suspect is. And so I was able to help on about six or seven cases with that project. And during the course of that, a, a gentleman by the name of Hogan Hilling, who was lived in Crestline, California, never in law enforcement, had no family members in law enforcement, but was just, I think, enamored with true crime shows. And so he wrote me and he said, hey, uh, I've got some personal things going on in my life. He had a special needs child. He had spent his whole life taken care of. Um, and, you know, he was had written other books. And he said, I, I really enjoyed watching the show and the concept of cold cases. And have you ever thought about writing a book? I said, look, I don't have time to write a book because we're, you know, going all over the world and, and just don't have the time. And he says, well, 
what if I come write the book for you? You tell me, you give me that old manuscript you were working on. Let me piece it together and let me go and get some case samples and I'll reach out to some other folks. So that's what he did. You know, I essentially tried to tag him with some of the experts that I have worked with over the years. You know, whether it was a Colleen Fitzpatrick in California or a Susanna Ryan in California or a Cloyd Stiger right up in, up in the mid, up Northwest, you know, whoever that was. And so I think he did a pretty good job of, you know, getting a, a decent book on cold case. It was designed for two audiences, right? The detective that has no knowledge or experience in cold cases that can pick it up and it gives you an outline or investigative roadmap. But it's also, I think, appealing to maybe cr true crime enthusiasts or, you know, web sleuths or what have you that, that want to know some of the, you know, components of working cold case without us revealing, you know, intricate tradecraft as to how we solve cases. So that's kind of it in a, in a nutshell. And I just want to say this, you know, your, your other guest here, Tom Myers, and Tom's been with you. He and I, before you went on the air here, just had a little chat. And man, he is so right. It is. I, I love it. He said meat eaters, right? Because is there any ham on that bone? That's what we're looking for in a lot of cold cases. And, and he is so correct. You know, there's only, when you look across the country, there's probably, and I think he's his, I think his number is very accurate, hundred, couple hundred people, you know, that, that what we're, a true meat eaters, right. That are dedicated, that live, still live and breathe this stuff, even though we're retired, you know, our day in the sun is over officially, but we just can't let it go. And so uh, I applaud you. I know uh, Tom has been with you. I don't think you could have gotten anybody better to promote your MVAC because it sure sounds like a little bit of research I did on him. He's got some great depth to him. And he's been in a lot of different places with the FBI, you know, and, and I think that, you know, he, he's given you a great optic and not just for you and your, you know, your company, but for, for all of the consumers of the MVAC, when they come to you, you know, you got to have the knowledge of, of how crime works, right. To really be able to effectively use. We got to be careful though here, Joe, because um, Tom, Tom will get a big head here. Well, we can let the air out of him. No problem, Jared. <laughs> so I, I was with the FBI. I'm used to being kicked in the face, you know, so uh, <laughs> yeah, we, can, no. we can walk that one back. Thank, thanks for the nice accolades. I feel the same way about you, Joe. Meat eaters and forensic savages, people who you, you have a conversation with them and they just know it right out the gate. And you're like, we're off and running. You said Cloyd before. He's uh, on board on something. We're working mutually. And it's just like, what a pleasure. And, you know, like conversations like this, what a pleasure because you, you just like minded people who are out there killing it. You know, just how can I contribute more? How, you know, I don't want you to contribute more to the team effort. And, um, yeah, it's a, it's, you're not working anymore. Yeah. I, have a, I have a quote I used to throw out there. It's from DeShiel Hammett, the, the Continental Op. And he says, I'm going to paraphrase here, but he says, I don't want to do anything else. He said, sure. And even back then, he said, I can make another. 20,000, I think is what he says. And I'm going to send it to you guys afterwards and we should inject it in the show. But he says, I don't want to know anything else. This is what, what makes me happy and, um, and doing what you enjoy. He goes, don't have anything against money. It's good stuff, but doing what you want to do. And, uh, you can't weigh any sum against that. And I'm paraphrasing that, but yeah, exactly right. And, uh, how, uh, what, what a better, you're truly, truly making a, an imprint on society. You're making a difference. You're giving victims back a piece of that. And the whole community kind of heals when you solve one of these things or at least exhaust these things. Uh, and as long as I got my hand on the throttle, I'll continue here. Yeah, I worked something, uh, actually a, um, a guy I knew from the army and we dug on that a little bit and got some luck and somebody jumped into the middle of it. And you're talking about mm, not quite Hatfield and McCoy's, but there were a lot of tense moments about who did this rape homicide and it ultimately resolved itself. But you talk about decades of like somebody gets enough drinks in them, they're possibly going to go out and kill the wrong person. And now you got a compounded community problem and it's resolved. It's resolved and there's healing that goes on. So yeah, I'm glad to be part of any of the efforts. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Before we get too far along now, you know, my, my copy of your book is not supposed to be here till tomorrow. So I'm kind of embarrassed about this, but I, I made a copy of this. This is Joe's book, Solving Cold Cases. So all of you that are out there and you know, it's interesting, Joe, as you were talking, first of all, what, what it, it you almost gave me the impression that, you know, at, it, prior to maybe 1995, cold cases weren't really a focus. Is that, 
not the case or, or is that just kind of, you know, that's when we really started hearing about people working on cold cases. You know, Jared, I mean, you can go back to some of the original history of cold case dates back to the seventies. Right. And ironically, some of the first effective squads was the LA County Sheriff's uh, department, not the LAPD. Right. That's kind of interesting, but they, they kind of trace the, their origins of cold case work back to the mid seventies. And there were people doing it. Don't get me wrong. All through the eighties and through the nineties, I just don't think, you know, you didn't have the advent of the internet information was not, or the information flow was not easy, right? For folks to consume information about crime. And then I don't, you know, there, I think cable television and the internet created this explosion or fascination with true crime. And that has fueled the recent explosion of, I think, cold cases. Now, cold cases have kind of like, you know, up over the years, they've kind of went up and down, right? In terms of the ability for departments to, to dedicate resources to it. You'll notice that, that shortly after 9-11, any, any efforts on cold case, you know, were almost non-existent because, you know, the, the country was enamored. I'm sure Tom remembers it was enamored with chasing terrorists. Right. And that's what everybody did. You know, now any cold case work like our my old agency at NCIS, our cold case focus was, you know, old war crimes or, or murders in a war zone, you know, from that had not been uh, or a terrorist act like. Maybe the Macheteros down in uh, Puerto Rico, or uh, you know some of the bombings uh, at, at embassies of military members, you know that were attaches or assigned to an embassy in foreign countries. But um, there's an explosion today with cold cases, and it's and it's interesting what the dynamic because most of today's cold case work is centered around what you're doing with the MVAC, right? And and of course the the, the come along to that or the follow along to the MVAC is investigative genetic genealogy or forensic investigate, you know, FIG, whatever, IgG, whatever people want to call it today. They're different. Depending on who you're with, they put a different little, little rhyme to it. But, you know, we didn't have that until really, I mean, we had it before Golden State, but, it, you know, if you go back to the canal killings in Phoenix in 2015, Colin Fitzpatrick yeah. worked on that. And that was really the first big case where investigative ge genetic genealogy was tagged but it didn't catch any steam, right? It, 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 what the theory or the, the concept was not ripe. And so it didn't, you know, it didn't gain a lot of traction until Golden State. And then since then, you know, because used to how we solve cold cases is, yes, you would go into an evidence locker, find this piece of evidence, you know, from 20 years ago that had not been re-examined by our lab or maybe some new technology is used to where we find it. But, you know, there was a lot more, cold cases solved through interviews, right? And interrogations. Mm -hmm. And and if, if people having to carry that burden for so many years of having killed someone to where you get skilled interviewers and interrogators working against them to elicit, you know, a confession. But that all changed with Golden State. And so you'll see the, the primary focus today is more technological based, right? Like what you're doing with the MVAC. What still blows my mind is how few MVACs are out there. Because as I travel around the country, it's almost daily where I see a garment, right? And I think it works best on clothing. If I understand correctly, the technology may correct me on that. But I think the best, you know, I see a lot of cases where the suspect was grabbed, the suspect was, you know, there's no doubt, you know, when you just look at the old scene photos, oh my gosh, that, that suspect totally, you know, ripped those clothes off of that yeah. victim. Or you can clearly see they went into the victim's pockets or... So, you know, when I when we talk about the optic, I think, and not to sound negative, but I think we're in such a fast-paced world now that detectives are first leaning to technology, which is good, right? What I think yeah. we're we, we need to get back to a little bit is okay in working parallel is very strategic interviews of key witnesses, very calculated interrogations, and in, you know. One of the things that's worked so well for me over the years, it's in the book. Uh, I have a colleague here uh, that just retired from the Raleigh Police Department, Jerry Falk. He has worked for him as well, is doing interrogations in non-traditional locations, right? I.e. not the police station. So sometimes that's the suspect's house. That's a city park. You know, that is in some very, you know, a, a low-end hotel in the community. So, you know, there's different philosophies on how to work cold cases, Jared. I don't, I don't mean to ramble on here with you, but to me, I think this is a great time for 
for your product, you know, that MVAC, I'm just baffled of how few people are embracing, you know, because everywhere I go, you know, even in some cases, let's say a 40 year old case, they, they worked it 20 years ago. Right. Right. And then now they've re-inherited the case another 20 years later. So another set of detectives, it's already been looked at as a cold case, but now they're looking at it and I'm thinking, Oh my gosh, we should impact this. Right. This is certainly something that we would want to impact, but, I mean, to me, I think the future of law enforcement is investigative genetic genealogy. And, and my problem with right now, from a legislative standpoint, is no one, everybody's worried about privacy, okay? I think that's just crazy. Let's get rid of this privacy concerns. Let's use this stuff to solve crime, not just cold cases, but hot homicides. Can you imagine if we used investigative gen genetic genealogy on hot cases, right? It would solve how many, it's countless, right? And I think, you know, from my standpoint, also in labs, most crime labs, people are going to get upset when I say this, but they're not trying to solve cases. Let's use your impact for an example. Certain labs here in the South, you know, like in my state of North Carolina, you can only send 10 pieces of evidence to the forensic lab to start with. That's crazy. South Carolina, five pieces, right? And, and so they examine them and then they say, okay, we didn't find anything, so send some... You know, 30 years ago, and Tom knows this, you send everything from your crime scene, right? And they process everything. Mm -hmm. And that's everything. just not happening today. So, yeah. you know, there's a couple of obstacles, and that's where I think items like your MVAC are, you know, just so valuable because uh, that's what we need to solve these cases. You know, and, and that's what's solving the majority of today's cases is technology, as opposed to some of the old gumshoe detective work interviews, interrogations, you know, and circling the wagons back, that kind of thing. Thanks for joining us. Your attention today brings us one step closer to exposing and eliminating the evil that brings crime to our communities. Hit subscribe and share this episode. Together, we will bring justice to every victim.